Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our third of five talks about non-duality. Today we'll look at the duality that appears to exist between self and other, between me and everybody else. In our culture, with its emphasis on individualism and self-reliance, can leave us feeling cut off and at risk relative to other people. This sense of isolation and alienation is largely an illusion, and we can soften it when we remember how we all share a common human experience, despite the differences in our individual life stories. We have a capacity for interpersonal resonance with all beings, all people. And we all spring from a common family tree of life. Keeping these biological facts in mind, contemplating upon them, and meditating with them deep in our consciousness can help us feel less isolated and less separated. Let's begin. So non-duality wouldn't need to be discussed if we didn't live with a strong sense of duality. And today we're looking specifically at the apparent duality between self and other. This stems from a larger sense of being separate from the world of humanity. So we live on a planet with roughly 8 billion people, and they're divided into geographical regions, political parties, economic classes, religions, and other forms of identification that lead to strong sense of group membership, but promote feelings of alienation relative to others. And we can feel pretty stressed by this sense of being surrounded by hostile tribes. We can begin to approach this apparent duality by not thinking of 8 billion people or all these different tribes and groups and parties and so on, but instead thinking about individuals, because every individual is much like us. As we think about individual experience, we can begin to find ways of remembering and feeling into our common origin from a single tree of life. As we do so, we will feel less stressed, less unhappy, more connected. We will, in other words, promote a healing quality of non-duality. Now, technically, non-duality means not to. So the idea isn't that we feel merged into a single homogenous whole. Instead, it's that we retain our individuality, but we lose our sense of separateness and alienation. I think we can see how this happens in romantic relationships, whether between a male human and a female one or any other pairing of individuals, that we have a capacity despite the fact that we live in different bodies and are in some sense separate, we find ways to connect, resonate, and share common experience. One common experience we share is the vibrating feeling of being alive. There's a energetic, flowing, sparkling quality in our bodies, and each of us experiences that. Along with that come feelings of pleasure and pain and desires for being happy and avoiding harm. We share all of this inner lived experience. And so despite whatever differences might exist between us, how our bodies might look different, our ages might be different, our backgrounds might be different, we can internalize a sense of the other person's experience because of this shared humanity. Part of that shared humanity is a shared system of organs. We all have a brain and lung and heart. We all have intestines and stomach and liver. We all have a bladder and much more. We have reproductive organs and sure they differ between male and female anatomy, but they serve a united purpose. Not only that, but the organ systems are capable of resonating with one another. 
so that people that are near one another can begin to time their breathing together. There's evidence that their heart rhythms can sometimes align, and so on. And despite all the different tribes and nationalities and political affiliations, we are all part of a single human family. That fact doesn't get mentioned nearly so often as it could, but it is a fact, and we can use it to feel less separate. On top of all this, it is scientifically fairly well established. We can also keep in mind that there may be some more mysterious forms of connection between people that science has yet to elucidate. The end result of all of this is that in a certain sense, we are part of a single organism, a whole of life, the biosphere, the human family, etc. And yes, we have individual bodies, but they are so resonant and similar and related that it is not unreasonable to highlight how interconnected and holistic the experience is. So two people that care about one another can share pleasant times together and their bodies begin to share an experience of harmony and softness and sweetness. This can be scaled up a bit and include more than just two people. It could include a whole family or a whole musical band. We can think of many examples of people sharing positive, uplifting experiences. Of course, people sometimes share more combative experiences. And the shared feeling here, the shared physiological experience is much sharper, more jagged. This can be combat, as it were, between two people who are more or less equal in social status and power. It can also occur when one person oppresses or dominates another. But in either case, the feeling is one of stress and jaggedness. Surely in a case of domination, the more dominated person is going to feel the greater amount of stress, but even the person doing the yelling or the attacking or whatever it is will have a heightened blood pressure, tightness around the jaw, and so on, all of which is jagged and uncomfortable. So we have a range of human experiences that we can share, some soft and easeful and relaxing and pleasant, some harsh and sharp and tense and unpleasant. How these experiences get shared is somewhat understood. So we know we can affect one another with our words or our tone of voice or what sort of eye contact we maintain. We can use gestures, we can use touch, either gentle, kind touch or harsh, violent touch, our body language and facial expressions, whether we laugh or cry, all of this allows us to begin to share experiences. There are biological underpinnings to this, and there are changes in the body that track our relative shared experience, our relative resonance. There's also what are called mirror neurons that we'll take a look at in a moment. But again, it's worth mentioning that this list, these words and so on, cover part of how we interact, but it may not cover all. There may be more mysterious influences at play, ones that science has yet to work out. Turning to the mirror neurons, I think most of us have heard of these. They've been in the news for quite a while. The idea is that we have within our brains neurons that respond to what we see other people do. So if I see someone hold a banana, circuits in my brain will activate that simulate my own experience of holding a banana. They're the same circuits that would activate if I did, in fact, have a banana in hand. This activation of a parallel circuit in my brain is due to these so-called mirror neurons or mirror circuits. They could work when I see someone in distress, say someone suffering pain. My own pain circuits may activate, obviously not in as acute a way as for the person who actually has the structural injury or what have you, but I may in fact feel a slight twinge of discomfort in the same area as the person I'm observing. 
Similarly, I could see a family enjoying one another in a park, having a happy day, and I might be alone, I might not have a family, but mirror neurons will allow me, especially if I activate them consciously a bit, they will allow me to have a sympathetic joy watching these other people have fun together. So when there's discomfort, we are used to saying that if I am able to feel another person's pain, I am experiencing empathy. But of course, empathy can also kick in for these more positive experiences. And mirror neurons seem to have a lot to do with our capacity for empathy. The end result is that we resonate with one another's experience, partly because of the mirror circuits or the mirror neurons and partly because of other aspects of our physiology. This capacity to resonate with others can include more than just a small number of people that can begin to include larger and larger groups. We see this at sporting events when an entire crowd gets elated simultaneously when their home team sco scores a goal. This is one way in which we can remember that we're part of a single tree of life, that we share a common human experience. I had a strong sense of this some time ago when I went on a staff retreat with people who I worked with in a yoga institute. We had a closing ceremony pictured here where we each shared how much the others meant to us, what we got out of the weekend and so on. As time went on, a strong feeling of collective affection or even love developed. I felt it strongly and others did too, I hear by report. This capacity that we have to harmonize and synchronize with others, to resonate with them, is worthy of some time spent in contemplation and meditation. But we'll move on now and think of an aspect of shared experience that is familiar, which is the life trajectory. So each of us came into life as first a fetus and then an infant and then a child and a young adult and if we live long enough, we'll become middle-aged and elderly. It doesn't matter what our background is, all of us will experience a trajectory like this, and this is something that can bring us together with others. It allows us to empathize. We can share the joy of an infant, even one who's in a family that speaks a different language, has very different cultural patterns. And we can empathize with the discomfort of having the pains and difficulties that accumulate with age. Again, regardless of how related we are to that person or how similar we feel. So let's look at this life trajectory a little bit further in the next couple of slides. It begins when a human egg cell from a female body is penetrated by a human sperm cell from a male body leading to a fertilized egg and then a cluster of cells that is an embryo and becomes a fetus. This happens in the uterus, a very fascinating biological process takes place and we can look very briefly and very simply at an early stage of it. So here we see a human embryo. It doesn't look like much at this stage, but very quickly in a matter of weeks, it expands and starts to take on a shape that looks a little more human-like. This animation is a very simple one, but it makes the point that we develop and we all go through this stage of development. And these developmental stages don't stop after we complete the pregnancy process and are born. We come into the world as infants and then toddlers and then young children. And they continue, obviously, to develop. They develop in size and they develop in mental capacity, knowledge, and so on. Child development has been studied by many people over many years. In preparing this talk, I came across this system that it was developed by Edith Ackerman that I find quite intuitive, that we can use to remind ourselves how similar all people are 
regardless of their background. Edith Ackerman's theory of the whole child development identifies four natural urges that drive our growth throughout childhood into adult life, being me, us, the world, and human creations. So we'll look at those four that the narrator just named in turn, and I believe that we can each see how we all went through each of these developmental tasks. We all completed them in one way or another. Being me is about learning to use my body and exploring my mind. The ability to control my body allows me to discover the world, and as a result, I can get to know where I'm at and who I am. So certainly we each learned about our bodies in childhood and adolescence. I think puberty is especially a time when we do a lot of learning about what it means to have a human body. But earlier on, we learn to walk, we learn to use our hands, and so on. Us is about how I relate to friends, family, and strangers, and my understanding of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And clearly, it doesn't really matter whether we were raised in the United States or in a very rural area, or even as hunter-gatherers, we're going to have gone through a stage of learning about the people around us, learning how they work and how they interact. Making sense of the world means figuring out how things work. That's why we play. Through exploration, I quench my thirst for seeking logic and discover this universe. We've all played, we've all learned a lot, we've all figured out our own local environment as best we can. And again, this doesn't really depend on any particular ethnic or national or geographic category. Human creations is about me being able to imagine alternatives in my head. If I can image something new, I am able to go and actually create it. And human creativity is a trait that we all share and that we all value. And it's present in all of us, all 8 billion of us. So this is very much a shared experience of development. But although there's much that is shared, obviously our childhoods differ. They differ in how supportive or abusive they might be. They differ in the culture that we're raised in. They differ in what sort of education we receive and so on. Lots and lots of differences that propagate into adulthood and lead to very different people that we see as we move through the adult world. These differences can make us feel like we're not really sharing much in common with the others, and it can undermine our sense of empathy, particularly if these other people seem to threaten us or we, for whatever reason, don't trust them or we're competing with them. But then comes the later stages of life, old age, often illness, and ultimately, inevitably, death. So just as we all began very similarly as embryos, we all end identically in death. And this can restore a sense of shared experience that yes, we may be very different, but in some of the most important aspects of human life, we're the same. Another way that we're the same is that although we may feel like we're just individuals, we're connected with others, particularly early in life when we're always part of a family. We cannot make it to adulthood without at least some sort of family around us. And this family will, of course, have had times of joy and happiness. They might have been rare, but there must have been some of them occasionally when people were in good moods. And there will naturally be times of conflict and unhappiness and so on. But the interesting and very valuable thing about families is that we tend to love our family members, at least on some level, despite all these ups and downs. And sure, we may feel alienated from them for various reasons. We may be very angry, but there's always a kind of bond with family that is somewhat deeper and richer than a bond with someone we consider to be a total stranger. Someone is completely outside our family. And yet, in fact, the family is much bigger than we ordinarily realize. The size of our family is actually quite large if we take a biological view. So a modern human descended from earlier species of hominids. And those descended from earlier species that were ape-like, and then species that were 
more dissimilar from us, but still in our lineage. And those early primates were part of a lineage that evolved to increasingly occupy a land environment after first emerging from the sea. And prior to that emergence, there was a lineage that went all the way back to the earliest marine vertebrates. And prior to that, there were invertebrate ancestors going all the way back to single-celled life that was the basis of all life on Earth. So our family tree could, if we looked at it with a scientific perspective, not just include our mother and father and siblings, but include the entire biosphere. Every life form on Earth fits into that tree somewhere. How we fit in is interesting to examine. There's a website, a page of which is shown here, called One Zoom that allows us to animate the tree of life. So there is a path from the single common ancestor, the single-celled organism that started life on Earth, through various forms of life that leads to us in an evolutionary sense. There's an evolutionary family tree. And we can animate this tree to see where we are on it. So we're a little leaf at the end of one of the twigs on this very complex tree. And let's just move through the tree to see how complex it is. So we're starting to zoom in on that area where the human was placed, and we're moving further and further down the branches to smaller and smaller branches, to smaller and smaller twigs, going further and further along the tree, and finally kind of getting closer and closer to our little human leaf way inside the tree of life. And we can reverse this again to get a sense of how complex the tree actually is and how small our little leaf is when looked at in this way. We're zooming back, moving back to thicker and thicker branches, approaching eventually the trunk, but it takes a while before the trunk comes into view, and here we are. So despite the overwhelming effects of humans on our planet, in an evolutionary sense, you can see that we are nothing particularly special. We're just another leaf on the tree of life. And that tree of life is a beautiful thing. And this connection that we share with other humans and all life is likewise beautiful. That family relationship can help us feel less individual, isolated, and alienated. So too can all the human experience that we share with others and our capacity to resonate interpersonally. And then there is indeed a sense in which there remains much mystery about how all this works, how it all came into being. So this idea of not being two, to having an essential wholeness, begins to feel more and more real as we contemplate and meditate upon these truths, which we can do briefly in the remaining time of this talk. We can settle into the chair or the support of the floor. Feel how the earth upholds our body, keeps it in position. We can feel that stability of the earth. And as we settle into the support of the earth, we settle into the support of our body, feeling it breathe the earth's oxygen. Within the body, blood circulates, food digests, life vibrates. We can feel into our body cavity, the area of the heart and belly, the area between the front and back body, the area where hunger is felt and emotion 
an area that can feel pleasant or unpleasant, an area that we often ignore, but is ever with us. Each of us have this experience of human embodied life. And we can feel this human experience so easily right now. We can feel our hands and feet, feel our face, feel our back. And bodies can differ, they do differ. Some people don't have all the body parts because of some malformation or illness or amputation or injury. And yet we all know that all bodies have this inner experience, regardless of their wounds, regardless of their past, regardless of their heritage. We share this with all humans. And our bodies resonate, particularly when we're near, but even when we're at a distance. It's possible that your body might resonate with mine, according to my tone of voice and how I speak or look. feeling how sensitive the body is and remembering that all the 8 billion human bodies are equally sensitive and feel something much like this. Even if the personalities are different and some people seem closed down, the body is a sensitive, responsive, resonant organism that wants happiness and nourishment and safety. And our shared experience comes in part from our shared background, our shared origin on the tree of life. We share ancestors with every person on earth. And our species shares ancestors with every species on earth. It's one big family. Can we imagine that it's a family that can love itself in spite of the conflict and pain that seems so common? A family that might someday be able to move past all the trauma and live as a supportive whole, less dualistically, more happily. You could allow your imagination to give you a sense of living in a world that saw itself as a single family and see how your body resonates with that image. 